In the Chinese calendar, 2024 is the year of the dragon, the most powerful animal in the Chinese zodiac. It breathes fire, it can fly, it takes magic spells and holy weapons to kill it. In the United Nations calendar, 2024 is the year of the camelids. Camelids means camels and camel-like animals such as llamas, no, llamas spelled with two L's, and alpacas. Without a doubt, camels, llamas, and alpacas are not remotely as cool as the dragon. Okay, one thing they've got going is that they're not fictional creatures. But technicalities aside, why are they so important that a whole year has been dedicated to them? What have the camelids ever done for us? One of the best people to answer this question is Ilse Kohler Rolofsson, a veterinary scientist who has spent the last 30 years living and working with camel herders in India's Rajasthan state. For her work, she has been given the Nari Shakti Pudaskar, which is the highest award given to women by the Indian state, and the Federal Cross of Merit, the only medal given out by the German government. Okay, Elsa, so getting right into it, uh, what are camelids? I know what camels are, of course, uh, one-humped and two-humped camels, white and brown camels, tall things that, that live in dry areas, store water in their humps. Um, no, 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 they don't store water in their hump. What? Fat. No? It's only oh. fat, it's not water. <laughs> so where does that come from, the water thing? I don't know. It's like, it's a, it's, it's totally wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, no, it's fat. It's fat. You know, and it disappears when the camel, uh, when there's a drought, the, the hump almost goes goes away. And uh, when they have, there's a lot of lush forage, then the hump becomes really big. Yeah, it's a storage function for fat, not for water. So for water, the camels actually, their adaptation uh, mechanism is they use it very, um, they're decreasing their their need for water by um, by not excreting it and uh, in their urine and by not excreting it in their manure. Um, yeah, I mean there are various physiological mechanisms behind that. So, so camelids, okay. camelids are so that doesn't that term encompasses not just the the two hump bacterian camel and the one hump dromedary camel, but also the South American camelids. And there are four of them. They don't have humps, but they share a common ancestor with the, the so-called old world camels. And uh, so that includes the llama and the alpaca as domesticated varieties, and also the vicuña and the guanaco, which are wild uh, camelids. And so this, the ancestor of both these, you know, the, the big camelids and the smaller camelids uh, came, was in North America. And then some of them migrated south into South America and others migrated across the Bering State to, uh, into Asia and then finally into Africa. So they are, they don't look that similar, but they have, they're very similar, actually, I think, in in terms of behavior and, and other uh, things. But there is a big cultural gap. I mean, we we people who are working with dromedaries and bacterium camels, we have very little knowledge about what's going on in South America and vice versa. And so this International Year now actually uh, provides an opportunity for us to kind of uh, join hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So apart from a common ancestry, apart from a common biological history, uh, what else binds all these different uh, species uh, together? You know, both of both types are uh, adapted to really marginal areas. So uh, the, the camels in Asia and Africa are adapted to arid and semi-arid areas, and they don't thrive as soon as rainfall uh, becomes higher they can't take humidity basically and the uh, south american camelids they are adapted to highlands to uh, high altitudes of the andes they're associated with the andes so the the slogan for the international year of camelids is also like heroes of uh, deserts and highlands Mm -hmm. uh, 2024 is the year of the camelids. Uh, what makes this species, or rather this biological family of species, so important that a year is dedicated to them? Yeah, so, you know, just to, I mean, give a little bit of background. The 
the initiative for having an international year of camelids actually came from Bolivia. Uh, it came from South America. And um, yeah, so in South America, these camelids are very important for the for the culture. And so basically the camelids have the ability to utilize uh, sparse vegetation in remote areas where agriculture cannot be practiced. So they have, uh, you know, our uh, Asian and African camels, they can range over huge distances, they're highly mobile, and they can kind of harvest that really sparse and widely dispersed desert vegetation and um, transform it into uh, food, into milk and meat, and into manure, and into fuel, and into uh, physical energy. The um, and, and this is really their advantage, you know, they have that advantage of, of making use of really sparsely uh, vegetated areas. The, the animals in South America, they are adapted also, they're adapted to the highlands, as I said, and they, uh, they can produce food there. And, but in South America, fiber production is very important. That's actually a major product is to make that, um, you know, that really fine wool and fine fiber. <laughs> so more broadly speaking, uh, the fact that an entire year is sort of dedicated to them has got to do with the fact that they are an important source of uh, sustenance and perform uh, various other functions in very marginal ecosystems. Is that what it is? No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, after Bolivia made that, uh, you know, request to have an international year of camel, it's the FAO Food and Agriculture Organization actually got to work and, uh, you know, look into it and uh, examine what justification is there. And they so they concluded that these animals are very important for food security in marginal um, areas and that they're also ecologically uh, kind of beneficial and that many of them actually provide women have a big role in their management and they're important for the sustainable management of terrestrial ecosystems according to FAO. Mm -hmm. So speaking of marginal ecosystems would it be right to say that most people live far away from such environments and uh, if yes why should we care about what's happening with camelids? I guess what I'm asking is, what have the camelids ever done for us? <laughs> oh, no, they've done everything for us. <laughs> so exactly. I mean, people in the margin, they have no other uh, source of livelihood. I mean, that's that's definitely, I mean, there's a huge part of the world is arid and semi-arid. It's it's like, I think, one third of, of the the surface. Uh, so it's, it's a big geographical area. And but apart from that, camelids were historically incredibly important for transportation for for um, many centuries. Uh, the silk just mentioned the Silk Road. Now it, it was all dependent on on camelids to carry goods from China to the Mediterranean and to other places. So they they played a huge role in transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, Ilze, you are the veterinary scientist with a wide-ranging expertise, interests, and activities, but you do focus on, on the camels of Rajasthan in India. Uh, camels seem to be a big part of your life and your work. Uh, could you talk a bit about how that came to be? Okay, so yeah, I'm a veterinary doctor. And I didn't really, uh, you know, after I graduated and started practicing, uh, I, you know, I worked with farm animals, I worked with small animals, and I it didn't really um, uh, appear to me that much because it was very commercial. And um, so I was looking for some alternative, something to do with my life. And I applied as a volunteer on an archaeological dig in Jordan. And that's where I saw this magnificent camel herd and a Bedouin who was singing to them. And there, it was a very harmonious uh, relationship between people and animals. Yeah, I mean, there was a touch of romanticism uh, definitely involved. And then I started uh, reading and, uh, you know, reading and researching camels. And I, I just became so fascinated by them exactly for their ability to uh, thrive in desert areas and produce food under very harsh conditions and to cope with uh, very high uh, temperatures. And also, they're very efficient uh, producers in many ways. They, they are said to, to need much less food, uh, dry matter in order to produce uh, milk and meat than, uh, than, than cattle. 
so uh, you know everything what I read about uh, Camel just um, it enforced that my my liking. And so initially I was just fascinated by them, but then I learned so much about them and uh, found out how useful they are. And um, so initially I worked on camel domestication uh, since I my entry point had been archaeology and I was very lucky to have to be involved in some really spectacular finds of camel skeletons in Jordan. Uh, I found a whole uh, like a small camel caravan that had been uh, killed by an earthquake and was really well preserved. And then I excavated that. And so I, uh, yeah, I, I was very lucky. And then after a while, I was more interested in uh, working with live animals rather than with the bones of, of dead animals. And I uh, went for field work in, first in the Sudan, which was very um, fascinating too. And I, I, I wanted to actually continue working then in the Sudan. I, I did uh, ethnographic work with the Rashida Bedouin, and uh, but the political situation changed in Sudan. I couldn't go back to the Sudan. And then at the same time, opportunity opened up in India. And so I, uh, I had a research fellowship and I came to India and then I got stuck here, kind of. So around what year was that uh, when you left Sudan and came to India? There was a 19, uh, so I went to Sudan in 19, early 1990, and then in uh, September 1990, I actually, yeah, I had a fellowship starting in India. So I've been here for a long time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, while reading up about your work, I came across the term EVM, ethno-veterinary medicine. What is that? So ethno-veterinary medicine, I mean, that encompasses all the you know the traditional ways traditional i mean ways of, of treating animals as done by uh, societies who are not um, academically trained in a way but who have developed their own uh, body of knowledge and how to um, control and deal with uh, animal diseases and i was enormously impressed here when i when i first came to rajasthan because the raika which is this Hindu caste that traditionally built camels in Rajasthan, they had an enormous body of knowledge. They had a like a long disease classification uh, system. They had uh, all kinds of, of treatments. They even had a like a simple kind of a vaccination uh, with for camel pox and for sheep pox and um, while it maybe wasn't perfect, it was the only remedy um, uh, source of treatment available because the veterinary system uh, didn't really function at all. So people did not use um, the, the the academically trained veterinarians, government veterinarians, but they, uh, they relied on their own knowledge. And I thought this was something incredibly valuable. Uh, so I, I did my best to document what uh, what I could and now, I mean, that's almost 30 years ago, and now much of that has unfortunately disappeared. So at this point, uh, is the situation such that the more traditional ways of care and treatment of animals is disappearing, um, and the more modern, quote-unquote, ways are becoming more and more dominant? I would not say that here in Rajasthan, uh... Still, I mean, there's very they, the herders have very little access to um, to official, I mean, veterinary medicine. But I mean, we have to take out care and treatment. Right? I mean, care relates to the management of camels, and in the management of camels, I mean, nobody can uh, knows better than the Ica how to manage them in the mobile system. Camels do not do well if they are kept in a um, like in a confined space at all. And they do not like to be fed either like concentrate or something like that. They Camels love to go out browse and uh, eat from different types of trees. And according to traditional knowledge, they actually, they browse on 36 uh, different species of, of trees and shrubs. And, and it's, we can, we can see it here. Uh, I mean, in, in India, there's a, uh, this phenomenon in India, camels can't be used for meat. Huh? And, uh, but it's still, I mean, they get what is what they call smuggled, they get smuggled out of Rajasthan and then the camels, they 
get rescued by animal welfare people and they put them into a goshala or some, you know, some confined space and the camels really suffer from that. And the only way of, of getting them back to health is if if they once again have the opportunity to go out grazing and um, uh, with the Raika herder. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us something about the Raika? Uh, like all I know about them is that uh, their origin story is that Lord Shiva put them on earth with the express purpose of taking care of camels. Is is that correct? And what are they like? Yeah, so yeah, that's that's quite correct what you were saying. So they are uh, a, a Hindu caste. They are part of the caste system. And yes, they believe, I mean, they were made by Lord Shiva to take care of camels. And um, initially or historically, they actually took care of the camel herds that were owned by the Maharajas. Uh, they they all, the Maharaja of Bikaner, of Jodhpur, and so on, they had uh, their own camel herds, which they needed them for warfare and for transportation. And they had Raika looking after these herds. And the Raika were, yeah, even, you know, when colonial veterinarians uh, came and they wrote about it and they, they really appreciated the, the knowledge of the Raika, they said, I mean, even that the Raika, they, there's a certain uh, disease among camels called trypanosomiasis. And normally, I mean, you diagnose it by means of, a, you put a blood smear under a microscope. And they said their traditional uh, way of diagnosing the um, this disease is just as accurate or more accurate than looking at a blood smear under the microscope. So, um, so in 1947, at independence, these royal camel herds, uh, they were uh, dis dispersed and it was the Raika who actually bought them or somehow they got ownership over these camels, start, started breeding them themselves. And then in the 1960s, uh, the two-wheeled camel cart was invented, which was much superior to the ox cart. It had much larger wheels. Uh, the wheels actually came from uh, Dakota airplanes. And uh, so this camel cart was a, a major technological um, innovation that uh, provided a means of uh, transportation in, like, in desert areas where there's no roads uh, across sand dunes and so on. So there was a... a strong demand for camels to pull these carts. This, and this was until the, um, maybe the, the early 1990s or so, this demand uh, continued. So breeding camels was a good source of income for the Raika. And then, but then slowly, um, you know, modern modernity caught up with them and uh, the camel carts were replaced by tractors and vehicles. And uh, so the, the demand for camels really slacked. Uh, by about 2000 or so. So Ilse, you've already answered this partly, but uh, let me ask you this one more time. Um, at a time when veterinary sciences have advanced so much, I assume, why should we look to preserve the more traditional ways of animal care and treatment? No, I don't think veterinary science has advanced that much at all. And a big problem is also the delivery. You know, in remote areas, no veterinarian is going there. We have a system in India where, you know, treatment is free if you take your animal to a veterinary hospital. But how can you, you know, if you have a, a large number of camels, you can't take them all into a city, you know, to be treated in a veterinary hospital. It's, it's technically impossible. So people continue to rely on their, um, on their, Traditional. I don't like the word traditional, nah? but you know what I mean, knowledge. Because, I mean, it's knowledge that also keeps adapting and changing and integrating new kinds of information. So people yeah. rely on that. And an important part, again, is, I mean, not just to treat animals when once they're sick, but to keep them and manage them in a way where they do not get sick, where they remain healthy. And this is really a big concern. I mean, this is uppermost in the minds of the Raika is how to keep their animals healthy and you know they, they take them over they have to keep moving them around to ensure grazing for them um, it's a it's a very hard job and you can't I mean you never get a break basically you know you always have to move with your animals and um, the, 
the mental state of the Rika camel herders is just occupied by the well-being of their camels. And if you have a camel herd that is not looking good or is mangy or not well nourished, it distracts from your reputation. You know, it's really embarrassing. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I think I mean nobody than the Rika can better manage uh, camels, and no veterinarian can. Uh, I mean, veterinarians are there. You know, when your animal gets sick, you call the vet. Mm -hmm. Um. But keeping animals healthy is much more important. Is yeah. the key. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I I suppose the key takeaway here is that it is not about going for one or the other. It's about looking at in a particular situation, what is the best line of action or what is the best line of treatment? And also uh, you mentioned care and treatment are two separate things. And uh, when it comes to care, uh, it is about, you know, what is the most accessible line of care? And when treatment is needed, treatment is needed, then you call the vet. Uh, we have been talking about the international workshop on camel pastoralism. I uh, understand that you began the year with that event. For those listening way to the future, that was the beginning of 2024. Could you talk a bit about it? Uh, who organized it? Uh, what kind of people participated? What kind of things were discussed? Did you go out and see camels? And what would you say the workshop led to? Or what kind of outcomes do you think it will lead to? Or hope it will lead to into the future? So uh, the reason uh, why we organized this workshop was we wanted it to have th at the beginning of the year to kind of determine or direct the narrative of the international year into the right direction uh, and emphasize the role of pastoralists, nomadic pastors have in the role of the sustainable management of camelids now and into the future. Because we see a danger of uh, the narrative being just about you know how do we uh, not being people focused but but just focusing on the camel outside its uh, social and ecological context and just looking at it as a means of production like you know you look at, at the livestock in general cows are uh, they're just machines to uh, transform feed into food and pastors have a different attitude pastors Usually, in most cases, they have they regard these camels as their family members. They have a very close relationship. They see them as a co-creatures and not something that has to be dominated, but as as kind of partners, partners you know over generations. And we find this attitude we find that very important. And uh, from a you know from the perspective of humanity, that we shouldn't just uh, you know, exploit, uh, look at livestock as animals that, that need to be exploited for human uh, benefit. But we also, we need to be a little bit more compassionate that, than uh, we have been and that animal science has been. And also, it's very important that we look at livestock as part of the landscape, you know, that we don't just that we don't isolate it, it, it from, from its context as you do uh, in, in animal science where you just want to increase performance, 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 and you ignore all the externalities that kind of approach has for the environment and for animal welfare. So we wanted to highlight the, the value of that traditional knowledge. And and well, again, I've used that term traditional, uh, the pastoralist knowledge. And so we invited, we had, I mean, we didn't have that many resources, but we had a, a camel herding lady from Mongolia, uh, we had a lady from a Somali lady from Kenya who uh, organizes a cooperative of uh, women camel milk sellers. We had a representative from Iran and uh, we had somebody also from Peru. Uh, yeah, so for some reason, it wasn't even intended, uh, but most of our, you know, of our international participants were women also. Different days were devoted to different subjects. So on one day we we discussed uh, camel value chains. On another day we we discussed access to resources, uh, which are in many cases threatened uh, and and under pressure. And on one day we actually we shared um, everything uh, with the uh, camel herders and some government people in Rajasthan. 
And then we had a, we came and together and put together a, a, a statement or declaration also. I mean, it, it goes exactly into the value of customary knowledge and into the fact that a lot of grazing areas are uh, threatened. I mean, in Rajasthan, also in Mongolia, the mining is going on and uh, uh, removing a lot of water resources. Mm -hmm. And this Mongolian uh, lady, she actually said they had, uh, earlier on the family had kept all kinds of livestock, but they had switched now to keep only camels because they think they are uh, best for the environment and also best for uh, adapting to climate change. We also, in the statement, say, I mean, we we reject this this extractionist uh, perspective on on livestock, and mm -hmm. we want to have a, a different relationship uh, with livestock that is more regenerative to the environment. What what kind of outcomes are you hoping the declaration will lead to? So obviously, we're going to uh, <laughs> distribute it very wide. Uh, widely and I mean we hope that it kind of initiates this little bit of of thinking I mean this is a this is a rather radical view you know what I've what I what I've been saying and what we've presented in, in that declaration and we hope that it will make people think about the the dominant paradigm of of livestock which is livestock use which is just oriented at getting the maximum output and that um that will lead towards a change in thinking. I mean, I know this all takes, it's going to take a long time, but at least this is like a starting point and uh, we can come back to it again and again. And yeah, so I'm sure this is actually, it is going to change a lot of thinking. And I think we have influenced the uh, um, the the narrative uh, that that will happen now in the year and because we're putting camel well-being uh you know that mm -hmm. camel well-being in the center the years that shouldn't just be about how can humans get the most out of camelids it should be you know how do we ensure the well-being of the camel you mentioned that a lot of the uh, international participants were women is that a pure coincidence or do you think there's something to that that we must understand it, I think it was in a way it was coincidence, but I think also that's also in the statement that many of the uh, more innovative, innovative approaches are led uh, by women. Uh, and uh, for instance, in in East Africa, all the milk trade it's all organized by women. Uh, they they are the link between the camel uh, milk producers and the camel uh, milk consumers. They handle all that uh, aspect. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last question, Elze, is um, so pastoral food systems, such as those based around camelids, uh, these are essentially animal based food systems. And we are being led to believe by some very smart and kind people, I must say, that animal based food systems are bad because uh, they consume a lot of water, they take up a lot of land, they pollute the ecosystem, and uh, also do not produce uh, healthy or healthier food. The idea being that we should switch to eating plants and that if we crave meat, we should have soy meat. If we want to have milk, uh, we should squeeze it out of rice or oats or soy. Uh, sorry, perhaps this is too simplistic of paraphrasing, but uh, you know the perspective I'm talking about. My question actually is how do pastoralists, uh, keepers of animals, herders of livestock, how, how do they view this emerging movement? Do they uh, think about it at all? Or are they too far removed from it? And yeah, what are your own views on it? No, I, I you know, I think pastors are too far removed from it, actually. I, I don't think, I mean, the ones here in Rajasthan, they're certainly not aware of it. And uh, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, has hit them yet. And my my personal opinion is this, a, I mean, that a lot of these accusations or you know, statements that are being made are wrong. Especially this um, statement that animals take up too much land, uh, because I mean, the livestock pastures this practice where crop cultivation is not possible. There's no other way, you know. Of and and that's a third of the surface of of the earth. You're not actually two. No, sorry. Let me uh, get this right. Two thirds of the so-called agricultural land 
cannot uh, be used for growing crops because it's too dry or too cold or too hot or too um, too mountainous uh, to, to grow crops. They can only be utilized by means of livestock. And livestock, grazing livestock, I'm not talking about livestock now that's being... Um, you know, yeah. kept in sanitary yeah. systems and, and so on, in confined systems or in large mega holdings. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about livestock that moves out there. Uh, that's a totally solar powered system, right? I mean, there's no yeah. fossil fuel involved when these cameras go out there and graze and they directly convert biodiversity into uh human edible food you know there's none of that you know those stages that are when you cultivate crops first you take out the native vegetation you put in a monoculture then you put the, yeah. you know you need fossil fuels in most cases to do that you put your chemical fertilizer then you have to harvest and all that there are a lot of steps involved and with pastoralism none of that happens you know you just have animals converting vegetation into food without destroying the biodiversity really yeah. you don't have that monoculture stage in between it's absolutely fantastic and the the protein efficiency is enormous it is so much better in those countries with uh, pastoral populations like ethiopia and kenya than you yeah. have in the us or so where you actually feed more protein to the animals than you get out of them so i, I think the problem is people you know there's not enough awareness about uh, pastoralists or you know these mobile animal uh, production systems among uh, the general public. You know they know they just know these uh, car force concentrated animal food uh, operations yeah. where, where animals are kept under horrible conditions and which are also ecologically totally wrong. I mean from every perspective except producing a lot of cheap um, cheap food. I mean, I totally agree those things should stop, but we must not lose our pastures, no way. I mean, they are they are of critical importance uh, for the future and for food security. Food systems should mimic nature as much as possible. And in nature, we have plants being fixed because they have photosynthesis cap capacity so they can you know, generate their own energy. Animals do not have that capacity, so they have to move in order to obtain energy from plants so animal so plants are fixed and animals are mobile and we have and there's no system without animals in nature you know you always have plant they are composed of plants and of animals and we have in you know modern agriculture has reversed that you know we are we have fixed confined the livestock and we bring the you know the food to them from the other end of the globe you know the soybeans especially in the netherlands the soybeans and and, and so on and that is this is the, the cardinal uh, problem with our modern uh, food system and if we want to you know as was the subject as in the uh, the last um, unccd cop in dubai now we have to look at how can agriculture reduce its greenhouse gas emissions and the the reintegration of animals and uh, plants I, I mean it's a it's the uh, the key solution to that this has to be solved we have to relook at at uh, agriculture and reintegrate crops and animals hopefully one day Elsa maybe one camelids workshop at a time <laughs>